Okay, good morning all. Welcome to um, Grand Rounds for the Department of Medicine. Um, I'm Allison Moore and I'm the Chief of the Division of Geriatrics, Gerontology and Palliative Care. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce today our speaker, uh, Dr. Anthony Molina. Um, Dr. Molina was recruited here in 2018 from Wake Forest University section of gerontology and geriatric medicine. There he was part of their um, Claude Pepper Older Americans Independence Center, which is a the P30 funded by the National Institute of Aging. His prior education included um, an undergraduate work at UCLA, PhD at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and two postdocs, one at Harvard and another at Boston University. Here, um, Dr. Molina serves as the Vice Chief of Research in the department of, in, in our division. And um, he is part of another NIA funded P30, um, the San Diego Nathan Shock Center um, in the basic biology of aging, leading the human cell models core resource along with Sanford um, Burnham Prebis Discovery as well as Salk Institute. Um, his research is focused on the role of mitochondria in human aging and age-related diseases and conditions. He's um, investigating in particular the role of mitochondrial bioenergetics in the physical and cognitive abilities of older adults and the pathophysiology of age-related diseases and conditions such as frailty, heart failure, and Alzheimer's disease. His team has developed and validated techniques that are being used to examine human bio, bio, mitochondrial bioenergetics and its regulators. Um, several of these techniques have been adopted in a variety of clinical studies being performed by um, his collaborators around the world. So without further ado, um, uh, please welcome Dr. Molina. Thank you so much. Awesome, thank you, Allison. Um, I'm guessing everyone can, can hear me okay and can see my slides. Uh, so first of all, uh, you know, thank you for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity to share some of the work that, that's going on uh, in, in my laboratory. And uh, I'll, I'll try to keep this you know, relatively informal um, and, and really hope to stimulate discussion. Uh, and also, you know, we're always looking for, for new collaborators. So uh, hopefully some of the things I'll talk about today will, will spark an interest and people, you know, please feel free to, to reach out to me to, to learn more. Now, in, in keeping with how we do uh, grand rounds in medicine, I was asked to, to share a little bit of my background and how I came to be doing what it is uh, I do today. And, and to do that, um, what I thought I'd do is start by taking everyone back to the, the mid 1980s. Uh, so this is me uh, sporting the, the latest in, in 80s fashion. Um, and uh, in the mid 80s, you know, I had just arrived in the United States. Uh, this is our first trip to, to Disneyland. Um, so really a, a wonderful day, but you know, things aren't quite what they, what they seem. So this actually isn't my, my family. Uh, I don't have two sisters, uh, but like many immigrant stories, um, I was actually brought to the United States by relatives, in my case, aunts and uncles, while my parent uh, stayed back in the Philippines where this was going on. Uh, mid eighties was the height of the people's power revolution and the overthrow of Ferdinand Marcos. Uh, but instead of being immersed in this, instead I was in California immersed in this. Uh, I was uh, uh, really enthralled by 1980s television. And it was a good thing because by the end of my first summer in the United States, I had learned how to speak English. And I also discovered my absolute favorite show, which was Mr. Wizard. Um, and, and what really fascinated me was that he could perform experiments using flashlights and walkie talkies to measure the difference between the speed of light and the speed of sound. And you know, I just found it enthralling that you could design experiments to answer you know, all of these fundamental questions uh, related to, to nature. And, and this really you know, set me to what I do today, which is basically the same thing. So I often feel like you know, I've taken this childhood hobby of mine uh, and somehow found a way to, to make a living doing it. Now, before I start, I do wanna share a picture of my actual family. Uh, this is my mom, 
Uh, she uh, raised me uh, here in Southern California in the mid 80s as a single mother and as a college student and really showed me the value of, uh, of an education. So I'm always appreciative to her for, for that. Um, all right, let's get started, uh, but let's get the disclosures out of the way. Uh, much of the work I'm going to share with you today is supported by the National Institute on, on Aging. Uh, here's a list of our ongoing and recently completed uh, grants. All right, so, you know, our work focused on mitochondrial bioenergetics and healthy aging is largely focused on three very basic premises. First, that one's genetics and chronological age is what defines that individual's baseline mitochondrial function. And that's depicted here by this dashed blue line. Then things related to our behavior, nutrition and lifestyle, the environment that, that we live in, determine the rate and trajectory of bioenergetic changes over time, as shown by these green and red lines. And then your resulting bioenergetic status where you fall within the spectrum is gonna then influence your risk and also the progression of age-related diseases and conditions. So in my lab, we think of mitochondrial bioenergetics as a integrative, uh, also cumulative, which is important for studies of aging and measurable functional outcome that can report on an individual's biological age. And importantly, it's something that's modifiable by intervention. So a lot of the work that we've been doing in the past several years has been focused on this question, whether we can use human bioenergetic profiling to advance precision health care for older adults. Some of our areas of research are going to be listed here, and hopefully some of these resonate with you uh, and that uh, you, know, you may be interested in, in working with us on some of these topics. Uh, the first area of research that we're involved in is patient safety, uh, whether we can use uh, bioenergetic profiling to predict whether a patient can safely undergo or benefit from a procedure or an intervention. We're also in, interested in improving outcomes, whether treatment can be personalized based on an individual's unique bioenergetic capacity. Uh, we have a large program focused on disease prevention and recognizing antecedent biomarkers that can be recognized so that preventative strategies can be implemented. And we have a, a lot of work going on with bioenergetic monitoring, where we are hoping to uh, profile bioenergetics in order to track the progression of disease or response to intervention. Uh, there are three you know, broad categories of approaches uh, that we and others employ for human bioenergetic profiling. Uh, these include invasive biopsy-based approaches, minimally invasive blood-based approaches, and non-invasive approaches. Uh, the invasive approaches are, you know, really permit very detailed analysis of mitochondrial function by respirometry or enzyme activity. Uh, it's focused on the actual tissue of interest. So for example, there are over 200 publications that have do, been doing uh, bioenergetic profiling of human skeletal muscle. Uh, in my lab, we're, we're known for our, our work on blood-based bioenergetic profiling, uh, which still permits detailed analysis of mitochondrial function, but uses circulating cells as surrogates that can report on uh, an individual's systemic bioenergetic capacity. Uh, some of the benefits about this is that, for example, these samples can be collected at multiple sites and shipped to a central lab like ours for analysis. Um, I'm not going to talk about non-invasive uh, approaches. Uh, we do utilize this in some of our studies, uh, but these are largely imaging based. Okay, so what are we actually measuring? So I'm going to share with you a, a figure of uh, the electron transport system. Uh, I, I promised Allison I wouldn't get too much into the biochemistry, uh, but there will be a, a test on this uh, at the end. Um, but you know, really, we can simplify our analysis of, of the electron transport system quite a bit by focusing in on the activity that's going on at complex four of the electron transport chain. So when, when electrons arrive here, they bind with molecular oxygen to form water. And it turns out that by measuring this consumption of oxygen that's happening at complex four, we can then uh, provide multiple inputs uh, going in through different entry points in the, in, into the electron transport chain and really start probing uh, 
where, uh, uh, what's driving differences in mitochondrial function. So here we're feeding electrons through fatty acid oxidation, complex one, complex two, uh, glycerol three phosphate. We're also looking at maximal respiration. So what we've designed here is a single assay that can diagnose different mitochondrial activities. Uh, we've been using this approach in, in numerous studies, uh, focused on things that are going on both above the neck and below the neck. We have projects focused on Alzheimer's disease, heart failure, and also the physical ability and frailty of older adults. Um, so let's go ahead and go into some examples uh, of our studies. And the first example I'd like to share with you is our work on heart failure. Uh, heart failure is, you know, um, really a, uh, recognized now as a disease of aging. Uh, it's the most common cause for hospitalization among older adults. And the particular form of heart failure we're interested in is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which now accounts for about 50% of all heart failure cases. Uh, the number of HEFPEF cases is going to continue to grow because the common risk factors for this form of heart failure are things like obesity, diabetes, and age, things are all, that are all going up in, in our population. Uh, the primary manifestation of HEFPEF is severe exercise intolerance, and it also has a numerous features uh, that signify an accelerated aging phenotype. Now, unfortunately, uh, therapeutics targeting cardiac function for HEFPEF have largely failed. Uh, but interestingly, the treatments that have shown promise are things like strength training and caloric restriction, interventions that are thought to have systemic effects. Uh, and there are now multiple lines of evidence indicating that impaired skeletal muscle metabolism in HEFPEF is what is likely being targeted by these interventions. So we became interested in first defining what's going on with skeletal muscle mitochondrial bioenergetics in patients with HEFPEF. Uh, so we recruited uh, 27 patients with HEFPEF uh, and 45 healthy controls. Uh, these two groups are relatively well age matched um, and uh, the proportion uh, of, of women compared to men was, was pretty similar between groups. Again, HEFPEF is more common among older women. Uh, you will notice that there are dramatic differences in BMI an average BMI of nearly 40 and a half PEF patients and nearly 50% body fat. So this is really uh, part and parcel uh, of this disease. Uh, as I said, uh, the primary manifestation of half PEF is exercise intolerance. So as expected, we saw severely, uh, significantly reduced uh, peak VO2 in half PEF patients versus the healthy controls and a reduced uh, six minute walk distance uh, as well. So what we then did with these participants was to perform muscle biopsies and, and do high resolution respirometry of permeabilized muscle fibers shown here. And this is just a, 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 an example of the protocol that, that we employed. And what we found is that across the board and every uh, uh, parameter of mitochondrial function that we looked at was significantly lower mitochondrial respiration in the patients with HEFPEF compared to the healthy controls. I'm just pointing out these three with the red arrows because this refers to complex one, complex two respiration and the maximum capacity of the electron transport system. And focusing in on max ETS, you see that there's really good separation between our healthy controls and our half PEF patients. And then when we look at correlations to peak VO2, you get a significant positive correlation and excellent distribution between these groups. So really striking uh, the level of, of mitochondrial dysfunction we're seeing in these patients. Uh, we also looked at differences in physical ability here reported by the short physical performance battery score. This is a comprehensive score of, of various measures looking at gait speed, balance, and strength. And you see once again, there's this uh, positive correlation, uh, good separation between the two groups. However, you know, SPPV has these well-known ceiling effects because the uh, highest score you can get is, is 12. So we also looked at the individual components of the SPPV score and found uh, correlations with the four with time to complete a four meter walk and also time to complete a, a chair stand test. So again, really strong separation be, between these groups. So you know, this is a, an example of the work that we do with biopsy-based bioenergetic profiling. Uh, but what about blood-based bioenergetic profiling? 
uh, our hypothesis here is that instead of looking at biopsies, we can use circulating cells to report on systemic bioenergetic capacity. So this obviously has numerous advantages. It's minimally invasive. Uh, it's suitable for a wide array of patient populations, including frail older adults that we work with. Uh, it's suitable for serial assessments. So if you want to monitor bioenergetics over time, and it's also suitable for multi-site and off-site clinical studies. The general premise for why we use blood-based bioenergetic profiling is, is pretty simple. Uh, it's that these cells are circulating and continually exposed to other non-cellular circulating factors that we know mediate bioenergetic capacity of other tissues of interest. So, you know, we, if we think of uh, things that, of organs that are highly metabolically active and things that come to mind include the brain, the heart, and the skull, the muscle. So if this premise is correct, then blood cell respirometry should be able to recapitulate the bioenergetic capacity of these other highly metabolically active tissues. So a number of years ago now, we conducted a series of non-human primate experiments to, uh, to, to look into whether or not this was true. And indeed, we found that blood cells could mirror differences in muscle bioenergetic capacity. So here we, we, we took our, our vervet macaques, we did contemporaneous respirometric profiling of circulating monocytes, as well as permeabilized skeletal muscle fibers. And we, we did this in two different ways. In both ways, we looked, we saw strong, significant positive correlations between the blood and the skeletal muscle. We saw similar results with cardiac muscle. Uh, but in this case, uh, interestingly, we found that platelet respiration was, uh, was more significantly correlated uh, with cardiac muscle isolated mitochondrial function. Um, this, uh, these findings likely underlie why we have seen in the past that blood-based bioenergetic profiling is related to the physical abilities of older adults. So we had published that the bioenergetic capacity of PBMCs is significantly positively correlated to things such as gait speed. Also, uh, the SPPV score, once again, and also uh, peak knee extensor strength. Now, you know, is it just muscle? Well, no. Uh, it turns out that blood cells also mirror the bioenergetic capacity uh, of the brain. Uh, so here uh, we took, again, uh, vervet, uh, vervet monkeys. Uh, we did contemporaneous respirometric profiling of circulating monocytes and mitochondria isolated from the frontal cortex. And we saw that both ways we looked, we could see these significant positive correlations. Uh, looking at mitochondrial metabolism a different way, uh, we also did uh, FDG PET CT with these animals and looked at glucose utilization in three brain regions, the frontal cortex, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. And we saw that across these brain regions, there was still these significant positive correlations with the bioenergetic capacity of circulating monocytes. So uh, these correlations with brain bioenergetics are particularly interesting uh, when you think about the energy demand of the brain. So your brain accounts for 2% of your total body weight, but consumes 20% of your total body oxygen at rest. And this corresponds to about 60% of total body glucose utilization, uh, which you know, I usually like to tell people uh, is like your brain sitting there eating two McDonald's cheeseburgers every day. Uh, however, you know, since coming to, to California now, I like to point out that this is also the equivalent of one avocado toast uh, every day for your brain. Um, now, because of this incredibly high energy demand, the brain is also um, susceptible to systemic bioenergetic decline, such as what occurs with aging. So several years ago, uh, one of the postdoctoral fellows in my lab wanted to look at whether bioenergetic capacity measured in peripheral blood cells was related to human brain architecture. Now, in order to examine this, uh, we recruited participants um, we, and we, we brought back participants who were enrolled in an ongoing study called DHS Mind, which is a cross-sectional genetic and epi study that was investigating risk factors for cognitive impairment uh, and cerebral architecture uh, in African-Americans with type 2 diabetes. 
Uh, we brought back uh, 16 participants, uh, ranging in age from 50 to 81, uh, with BMIs ranging from normal to obese, and with different durations of type 2 diabetes. Our goal here uh, was to uh, maximize our range and to maximize potential differences in brain, in, in, in brain architecture in this small cohort. So this is a small diversity cohort. Uh, what my fellow found was that the respiratory parameters we looked at, uh, basic ones such as basal respiration, maximal respiration, and spare respiratory capacity were significantly positive. Well, some of them were significantly positively correlated to white matter volume and also total intracranial volume. Uh, but when she added on measures related to fatty acid oxidation, then we were able to see correlations really across the board, again, to white matter volume and total intracranial volume. So this early work uh, led to some of our ongoing studies focused on Alzheimer's disease. So I'm sure as you, know, you all know, there are still no you know, great preventative strategies or, or therapeutic interventions for AD dementia. Uh, and, you know, we, we've come to realize that AD pathology, including the development of irreversible neurological damage, is actually happening, you know, many years before clinical symptoms uh, and cognitive impairment become apparent. So our efforts to countermand AD dementia are going to rely on early detection of pre-symptomatic pathological changes. And it turns out that you know, a while back now, it's been promulgated that mitochondrial dysfunction is a primary event leading to the deposition of plaques and tangles that are hallmarks of this disease. So our goal for our work in Alzheimer's disease is to identify uh, bioenergetic signatures that predict later life AD vulnerability or resilience to AD. And in order to do that, we're examining transitions from normal aging to mild cognitive impairment, and then from mild cognitive impairment to Alzheimer's disease and, and related disorders. Now, when we first uh, proposed this study, uh, the, the reviewers you know, kept coming back to us and saying, hey, is this specific to Alzheimer's disease? So what we did was to show that the maximal respiration of peripheral blood mononuclear cells was significantly positively correlated to the amount of A beta 42 in the CSF. Now, keep in mind if A beta 42 is in your CSF, that's probably a good thing because it suggests that uh, A beta is being cleared from the brain. Now, do I think that these measures are, 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 are uh, specific to AD? No, I think these measures are specific to, to aging. But again, because of the exquisite metabolic demand of the brain, uh, we think that this is one of the, the organs that's, that's first affected by age-related bioenergetic decline. So here's the, the design of, of the study. Uh, we're actually now in the fourth year of this, uh, and we're performing bioenergetic profiling at year one and again at year four. Uh, every year, we're doing cognitive assessments and looking at various uh, AD uh, biomarkers and pathologies. Uh, including amyloid, FDG PET, and various CSF uh, biomarkers. Um, like I said, we're now in the fourth year, but I'm happy to share with you some of the uh, unpublished interim analysis. Uh, here are some of the characteristics of the cohort thus far. Uh, when we looked at participants uh, across our, our three groups, uh, normal cognition, MCI, and dementia, as expected, there's lower MOCA scores with MCI and dementia, uh, lower three uh, mini, mini mental uh, scores, uh, particularly in the patients with dementia. And then when we use a, a composite measure of cognitive function, uh, you see the stepwise decline as you go from MCI to dementia. Um, the, when we looked at uh, brain imaging data, uh, cortical thickness uh, was, was lower in the participants with dementia. Uh, and also these uh, significant differences in white matter hyperintensity. So we do think uh, that these, these participants have probable uh, Alzheimer's disease. So when we did our blood-based bioenergetic profiling, uh, first we found that across our basic measures of basal respiration, maximal respiration, and spare respiratory capacity, uh, these were all uh, significantly lower 
in the participants with dementia. But then when we did our high resolution respirometry that again took into account fatty, oxidation, fatty acid oxidation, we were able to see the stepwise decline in mitochondrial bioenergetics measured uh, in this case in, in PBMCs. So uh, very excited uh, about this work. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna change gears a little bit. I'm showing you two examples now of studies that were involved in one focus on heart failure and another focus on Alzheimer's disease. And everything I've showed you so far seems to suggest that higher mitochondrial respiration uh, is a good thing. Um, however, you know, that really can't be the case. Um, you know, mitochondrial bioenergetics uh, uh, should be in line with metabolic demand. Uh, and when it's too high, it can be too high, and you can get negative things uh, associated uh, with oxidative stress, for example. So we're now also trying to better define what an optimal bioenergetic profile looks like. And one of the ways we're trying to do that is by looking at what we would consider to be optimal lifestyles and diets. So when we think of an optimal diet, one of the things that comes to mind is a Mediterranean diet. Uh, this diet is uh, associated with better insulin sensitivity, better lipid profiles, improved blood pressure, and lower inflammation. And then when we think of non-optimal diets, well, we often think about the Western diet, which is associated with obesity, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, and high cholesterol. Now, we are starting to do these studies uh, in humans, but the example I'd like to share with you is a study that we completed with, again, not non-human primates, in this case, cinnamogus macaques. So the, you know, the benefit of using the primates here is that we can provide them with a diet for 30 months, which would be the equivalent of eight human years. So this would be like you know, two R01s. I think I measure time by R01s nowadays. Um, the animals, uh, given the Western diet, uh, were given things like lard, beef tallow, and high fructose corn syrup uh, in their diets. Uh, whereas the animals in the Mediterranean diet uh, had things like fish oil, olive oil, and fruit puree, things that actually sound edible. Uh, the interesting thing about this diet, uh, these diets, was that they were pretty well matched for macros. So similar amounts of protein, carbohydrates, and fat. But where the main difference was is in the composition of the fats. So more saturated fat in the Western diet, more monounsaturated fat in the Mediterranean diet, and also a better uh, ratio of omega-3 uh, and omega-6 fatty acids. Uh, more fiber in the Mediterranean diet, and also uh, less salt. So what did we find? Well, first let's look at the skeletal muscle. Again, we looked at skeletal muscle fiber bundles. I uh, did high resolution respirometry. And interestingly, what we found was that this time across the board, the animals given the Western diet had higher mitochondrial respiration again, in the skeletal muscle. And then also, in this case, with both groups combined, a higher respiration was associated with higher HOMA IR. So, you know, what's going on here? Well, we're still trying to figure that out. Uh, but one of the ideas is that maybe the skeletal muscle mitochondria uh, can be overstimulated by a Western diet uh, and therefore become more susceptible to damage uh, with advancing age. Now, uh, very recently, we also looked at what's going on in the brain. Uh, here, things get even more complicated uh, because the diets don't have overt effects. Uh, rather, what we see is that with a Mediterranean diet, when we look at mitochondria from different brain regions, there's a, a, a consistent pattern of higher respiration in the prefrontal cortex and then the rhinocortex cortex and lower respiration in the cerebellum. Again, this is within each animal. However, if you look at the animals with the Western diet, everything gets scrambled up and we lose these patterns. And also when we look at regions that we know are susceptible to AD pathology, such as the prefrontal cortex and entorhinal cortex, those regions now look to be uh, more susceptible to differences in fasting blood glucose levels. So maybe this is 
providing us with some sort of link to why uh, uh, poor diet and, 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 and prediabetes are linked to higher risk for Alzheimer's disease, dementia. Okay, so what could be driving these changes in systemic bioenergetic capacity? Now, as I said earlier on, we think blood cells can serve as reporters of mitochondrial function because they're exposed to circulating factors that mediate bioenergetics in various tissues of interest. Well, circulating factors also mediate key aspects of aging. And one of the uh, best evidence we have for this is actually coming from parabiosis studies that were performed uh, uh, over a decade ago now. And what researchers showed is that connecting the circulatory systems of young and old mice could have systemic rejuvenating effects for the older animal called the, uh, the, a parabiont and deleterious effects for the younger animal. And these effects were seen in various tissues, including the CNS, called the muscle, liver, heart, and pancreas. Uh, so a graduate student in my lab, who's now uh, actually defended her thesis, wanted to see if circulating factors could also mediate age-related bioenergetic decline. So what she did was to set up uh, three experimental groups. Uh, she connected the circulatory systems of young animals to young animals. These are isochronic controls. Another isochronic control is old animals connected to old animals. Uh, and then young animals connected to old animals, and they, these animals remain connected uh, for seven to eight weeks. Uh, at the end of that, uh, she collected soleus muscle uh, and did high resolution spirometry of, again, muscle fibers from these animals. And what she found was quite striking. Uh, so let me uh, walk you through this. And, and you know, the data is really the same no matter which parameters we look at, so let's just focus on maximal capacity. So as expected, you see the highest capacity in the young animals, uh, the young animals connected to other young animals. These are the young controls. The lowest bioenergetic capacities were exhibited by the old animals connected to other old animals, our old, old control. And interestingly, our heterochronic pairs shown here in the gray bars uh, are both exhibiting low bioenergetic capacity that looks a lot more like the old animals. Um, but what's most striking to me is that now the bioenergetic capacities of the young animal and the old animal have become equalized with this connection of their circulatory systems. So this really uh, demonstrates quite clearly that circulating factors are driving age-related bioenergetic decline. The data is even uh, more striking uh, when we look at differences in mitochondrial morphology. Here, looking at total mitochondrial area and average mitochondrial area, really all the groups, the, the old animals and, and the, the heterochronic pairs, all look like they're exhibiting old, short mitochondria. Okay, so now we know that circulating factors could be driving some of these age-related differences, uh, but you know, what I've shown you so far are simply uh, animal studies. How do we translate this to human studies? Well, here's what we've been doing uh, so far. And one of the first questions we wanted to address was whether circulating factors could mediate the bioenergetic benefits of an intervention. So we wanted to go with an intervention that we knew was good for us. Uh, so we went back to a study completed in 2013 called I'm Fit. And this study was looking at the benefits of resistance training or resistance training paired with caloric restriction in overweight to obese older adults. And this is our approach. We incubated naive cultured muscle cells in serum samples from IMFIT that were collected before and after the intervention. And then the following day did high throughput respirometry to look at bioenergetic uh, changes associated with intervention that are solely mediated by circulating factors present in serum. And here's what we found. We found that indeed circulating factors in this in vitro study could confer the bioenergetic benefits associated with exercise. Uh, let's look uh, at the resistance training only group. Uh, and again, let's focus on maximal respiration. 
you can see that the difference between pre and post uh, uh, resistance training uh, was 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 significant uh, was significant and, and, and went up. Now, how about when you add caloric restriction? Well, the caloric restriction group from this clinical trial uh, also exhibited uh, improvements in physical performance, but they did lose muscle mass. And what we found was that serum from these participants could still confer bioenergetic benefits, although these effects are somewhat blunted compared to when you're looking at resistance training alone. Um, so are these improvements actually associated with the physical improvements that were seen in, in the clinical trial? Uh, well, first we looked at this change in maximum respiration and the individual's perceived physical ability measured by something called the MAT-SF. And we were able to see significant positive correlations with the change in respiration and the change in perceived physical ability. Now, what about objective measures? Well, we saw similar results when looking at changes in the 400 meter walk time. Didn't quite reach significance, uh, but you know, this is still quite uh, a strong uh, relationship looking at change in max and change in time to complete a 400 meter walk. Um, we have started looking at whether we can see the same thing with our Alzheimer's disease participants. And indeed we can. So when we took serum from our participants with normal cognition, uh, cognitive impairment and dementia, exposed naive neurons in vitro to these serum samples, again, we could see bioenergetic decline in the neurons exposed to serum from patients with MCI and dementia. Uh, and these differences in uh, neuronal respiration mediated by serum is also significantly positively correlated to cognitive function. Okay, so we now know that there's something in human serum that seems to be doing something important to, to mitochondrial function. Uh, but importantly, you know, we really need to identify what these circulating factors are. Uh, and these you know, have really important diagnostic, prognostic, and even therapeutic applications. Um, so this is uh, something that we're currently working on here at UCSD uh, and something that we admit is going to be quite complicated. So there are a number of possible candidates for mitoactive factors in human serum. These include microbiome derived factors, circulating proteins, metabolites, exosomes, microvesicles, and also uh, things associated with inflammation. So this, these questions are going to keep us busy for quite some time. Um, and we do have projects ongoing uh, focus on uh, some of these individual components. Um, the example I want to show you briefly is our work uh, focused on metabolites. Uh, specifically bioactive metabolites that are derived from fatty acid oxidation. Uh, so what we did was to send, again, samples from our ongoing study of Alzheimer's disease uh, for metabolomic analysis in Dr. Mohit Jain's lab. And then what we did was to map the bioenergetic effects of the serum samples. And this is something that I, I showed you in the previous slide. Uh, and we map those effects with the abundance of the known and predicted molecules. And there are 328 of these. And what we found was that of these 328, uh, 38 seemed to be mitoactive, meaning their abundance was associated with bioenergetic effects of serum. And of these 38, about 12, uh, 12 of them were clinically relevant. And in this case, that meant they were also related to cognitive performance of the serum donor. Of these 12, uh, nine were inhibitory and three were stimulatory. Now, the important next step for these sorts of studies is actually validating our predictions. And several of these molecules were actually commercially available. So we took one of our predicted inhibitory molecules, did a dose response study uh, against neurons. Uh, we could see that with increasing doses, there was lower respiration. And then with a predicted stimulatory molecule, uh, we were able to see that with increasing doses, there was an increase in, in respiration. Uh, hoping to be able to share with you the, the identities of these molecules soon, uh, but we are you know, currently now still actively trying to validate uh, these data. Okay, so I'm going to start wrapping up, but you know, I wanted to talk a bit about where are we now. So let's go back to 
uh, this graph that I showed you in the beginning. And then I think what we're beginning to understand is, you know, our goal for, uh, um, I guess, preserving or improving mitochondrial function is to get mitochondrial respiration high, uh, but not too high. So not, not a very satisfying uh, scientific uh, goal for, you know, what, what we're trying to do with, with our patients. Uh, but that's, you know, where we're at. Um, but the other question that remains is, you know, trying to define this blue line. So what is age-related bioenergetic decline? What does normal look like? And potentially, uh, this question might be easier to address because this is going to be driven uh, by things such as chronological age and genetics. <clears throat> However, uh, of course, things are never as easy as they seem. Uh, the challenge here is that aging is highly heterogeneous and cell and tissue specific. And in the case of age-related bioenergetic decline, there's differences in intrinsic metabolic demand among these different tissues. And these differences are also going to underlie their susceptibilities to age-related bioenergetic decline. So really one of our long-term goals now is to try to define age-related bioenergetic decline in a cell type specific manner. Um, however, you know, obviously we're, we're not gonna be collecting samples from all of these you know, tissues uh, and people of different ages, uh, but the way we're gonna approach this question is actually uh, with support from um, the San Diego Nathan Shock Center. And the overall theme of our center is actually the heterogeneity of aging. Uh, as Allison mentioned, this is a consortium between the Salk Institute, um, the UC San Diego, particularly our team in the Division of Geriatrics, uh, and also the Sanford Burnham Prebus. And the, as the, the, the aspect of the center that, that I'm involved with is in, is, is in the human submodels of aging core resource. And what we're doing now is we're enrolling a new cohort of participants here in San Diego that's representative of the adult human lifespan. And from these participants, we're uh, conducting very extensive clinical and cellular phenotyping to characterize biological age. And importantly, we're involving the broader research community to characterize these new cell models of aging. So what are these new cell models of aging? Well, we are generating subject-specific fibroblasts from all of the participants in our cohort. And then really based on seminal work from, from Dr. Rusty Gage, we're making induced cell models and iPSC-based models. With these two cell models, we're able to characterize phenotypes of aging, including mitochondrial bioenergetics, because these induced cell models retain age-dependent phenotypes, whereas these, age, these iPSC models are rejuvenated and will show us age-independent phenotypes, so things related to, to genetics, for example. Okay, so with that, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the, the members of my team who actually do uh, the work that I've shared with you today. Uh, and also, thank you for, for your attention and hanging out with me early this morning. Uh, remind everyone to keep your mitos fit and healthy and uh, happy to answer uh, any questions at this point. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> that was fascinating and a, and a lot. Um, so um, I have three questions so far in the, um, in the chat and Q&A. Um, so the first is um, from Tim uh, Bylash. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, so he says part of the mitochondrial function is to provide energy for cell growth, NADH versus function ATP. These processes are exclusionary, in particular, aerobic glucose versus lipid metabolism is compartmentalized, both dependent on mitochondrial integrity. Why do we owe, um, maybe he's saying ignore, the endocrine system and the role for for T3 in mediating this. Published data shows this hormone is absent in patients dying from COVID and replacement has been a benefit and shown um, fundamental um, in this. And he says stat three integrin. 
and other disease processes such as emotional depression and congestive heart failure. Um, it's a long thing. I can email you this too. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm able to see the, the, the chat. Yeah, <laughs> it's a long yeah, one. This is, this is great. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, so he said blood and skeletal muscles are highly dependent on T3, which appears to be causative and explain the correlation in studies you cite. Um, ROS are highly damaging to mitochondria. And he says he's happy to talk to you more about it. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like we need to, to add another thing to, to our list of uh, uh, potential candidates to look at as, as mediators. Yeah. I'll of, email you the question. Yeah, so uh, yeah, Tim, please uh, reach out to me. I'd love to discuss that further. Yeah, um, Joseph Carbone um, has another question. Um, very interesting. I'd be interested in seeing a transcriptome transcriptome or genetic, um, hold on here, uh, or genetic studies with the same experimental groups you used with the circulatory factors. Is there any thought as to what the targets of these circulatory factors work on in our genome? Are they epigenetic or genetic? Um, great question. And, and I think this really points to, you know, a lot of low hanging fruit that still remain to be, you know, answered. And I think part of, you know, why we're um, a bit behind in making some of these connections to, you know, to, to very fundamental questions such as this one is that, you know, you know the approaches that we're using are still relatively new. Uh, you'll see that a lot of the studies that we've published and other groups have published so far have been very small focus studies with like you know, 15, 20, 25 participants. And we're just now getting to the point where we're doing you know, studies in the orders of you know, 500 people. We have another study focus on frailty. That's gonna be uh, the biggest so far that's um, focused on 900 people. So I think we just now have the opportunity to, to answer these sorts of questions. Uh, but we're also always looking for you know, people who want to make use of kind of these data and, and, and these samples uh, and, and, and want to you know, answer questions such as the, the one that's posed here. So yes, excellent question. Hope we can uh, address that one day. All right, there's more. How does, uh, from Peter Wagner, how does mitochondrial PO2 play its own role in your domain? PO2 is intertwined with my question. PO2 is intertwined with mitochondrial bioenergetics? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, th this is not, you know, something that, that, that we've been able to, to look at um, in detail yet. Um, you know, for example, with our high resolution respirometry systems, um, we, we set, you know, our, our oxygen concentrations to uh, whatever is going to give us kind of the best signal, but certainly uh, there is a sensitivity to it. Um, and how that may play a role in these differences that we're reporting um, is something that you know we should be be addressing and looking at. Right. And from Sanjay Mehta, wonderful talk. You spoke about resistance training, but endurance training seemingly would increase bioenergetic capacity. Have you observed this as well? Oops. Um, which one was that from? Oh, sorry. Um, from Sanjay Mehta, it's on. Um, does have you observed endurance training to have any effects on um, improving bioenergetic capacity, as you have witnessed in resistance training? Yeah. So um, endurance training, we haven't done those studies ourselves, but there is some evidence that um, endurance training is is particularly um, suitable for improving fatty acid oxidation, for example. Uh, and I think that may have something to do, um, you know, with with some of the work that we're that's coming out, focus on endurance athletes and how well they're able to utilize fat uh, compared to us us normal people. Um, and yeah, I think that that that's a, a very cool question. Um, we haven't done endurance training studies ourselves, um, but <clears throat> would be interested in, in, in doing that, especially now that we have these assays that can specifically probe for fatty acid oxidation directly. Uh, those studies act, <clears throat> have actually been done. Okay. Um, another question from Don Rubin. Are the differences in diet related to aging directly, related directly to metabolism of the food by the host 
or secondary to effects on the microbiome, including secondary immune related changes? Yeah, um, another you know, awesome question. And I think, um, <clears throat> excuse me, among the, the, the candidate factors that I listed in my slides as potential mediators of systemic bioenergetic capacity, I, I did put you know, microbiome-derived metabolites. So uh, someone pointed out to me you know, a number of years ago uh, that you know, a lot of the, 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 the things that are metabolized by mitochondria are actually coming directly from uh, our microbiome or going through our microbiome. Um, we haven't um, looked into that directly yet. Um, had a couple of conversations with, with Rob Knight about how to do uh, these studies. Um, so it is, it is on our mind, um, but yeah, no data so far. And last um, comment um, question, Jisha Joshua. Um, a very interesting data, another clinical scenario where this might be relevant and interesting is to look at to look at would be patients with pulmonary fibrosis, which is thought to be an early aging manifestation of the lung. Um, he's interested in talking with you about that. Yeah, that'd be great. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that, that we're starting to do is looking at multiple biomarkers of biological age, you know, at the same oh, she, time. Sorry. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, everything that I've showed you is focused on, you know, mitochondria as a hallmark of aging. But obviously, there are other hallmarks of aging that we can look at as well to examine, you know, accelerated aging phenotypes. Uh, and, you know, I'm hopeful that, you know, also with support from the Nathan Shock Center, uh, we can do, you know, these sorts of studies of accelerated aging with different disease conditions uh, more comprehensively. So, yeah, I'd love to chat. Okay. Yeah, sorry, Dr. Joshua. She's a she. <laughs> I'll connect. All right. Um, that's it for the questions in the chat. Um, let me see if others are missing. Okay, yeah. Um, so a lot of good questions. Um, so Anthony, where next are you going with your work? Um, where are you seeing the science going now? <laughs> um, yeah, I think right now we're, we're, we're being pulled in, in, in really a, a number of directions. Uh, as far as the clinical questions that, that, that we can address. Uh, and I think one of the things we're excited about uh, is, is really doing kind of bigger studies than, than what I've shown you so far. Um, you know, technologically, I think a major advancement uh, is that, you know, we can now receive samples from really around the world uh, from various sites. Uh, so people have been, you know, sharing with us their repositories uh, you know, samples that they've collected in previous cohort studies, previous clinical trials, uh, that they now, you know, secondarily uh, want to see if there are any mitochondrial phenotypes associated with, you know, uh, the various studies that they've done. So I think over the past year, we've been getting samples from, from everywhere. Uh, and when we really, you know, are now setting up so that, you know, we can handle uh, you know, a, a broader array of questions, uh, bigger studies. Uh, another thing that I, I should mention is that we're also, you know, setting up a, uh, a core resource facility. Um, um, and, you know, a lot of the uh, approaches that I've shared with you today, uh, we're hoping to, to make more broadly available through, through collaborations. Thank you, fascinating. Well, without further ado, maybe we can um, have a few minutes um, before our next meetings and please claim your CME credit. <laughs> All right. Thank you so very much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Fantastic. All right. Take care.